Hey everybody and welcome to another episode of React Native Radio. My name's James and I'm going to be your host today and we're joined by Steve Young from AppMasters. Steve, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. I am the founder of AppMasters. We've been in the app space since 2011, James. Started a podcast on the side because I was doing apps on the side. I actually taught mm-hmm. myself how to code in Corona. And <laughs> they were called wow. Corona. Luckily, yeah. That was just a happenstance, James. I didn't even plan that. But <laughs> <laughs> anyways, it was based off of Lua. And I knew HTML back in the day. And so I taught myself how to code using that platform, I'll just say. And mm-hmm then started launching apps. And so I was doing like about a thousand, 2000 a month just on the side. And I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I sold cassette tapes when I was in elementary school. So I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. Didn't know what that journey would look like. I was running growth for a startup in San Francisco. But in 2013, I decided to start a podcast, really learn from my heroes in the app space. So like co-founder Shazam, Creators Clear, Tweetbot, and the audience started coming to me for marketing help. And my mark, my marketing was more on the online, you know, direct response and doing content marketing, growth hacking. But enough started coming to me that six months after starting the podcast, I ended up leaving that startup job and doing this full time. And so what we do is we're a marketing agency now. We help people. We still have some clients of our, I mean, some apps of our own, James, but mm-hmm. primarily we focus more on ASO, which is SEO for the app store, helping clients with some of the retention and monetization side pieces too, and then any type of marketing. So Facebook ads and different growth hacks that we can explore too, James, later on that allow you to get thousands of downloads without spending much money on marketing. So I can go through some of the details later on. This sounds incredible. Hey folks, are you trying to figure out how to stay current with React Native? Maybe you heard the Chain React conference was canceled and you're a little bit sad about that. Well, I borrowed their dates and I'm doing an online conference. So if you want to come and learn from the best of the best from React Native, then come do it. We have people like Christopher Shadow from Facebook. He's going to come and he's going to talk to us and answer questions about the origins of React Native. We're also going to have Gant Laborde from Infinite Red and several of the panelists and past panelists from React Native Radio. So come check it out at reactnativeremoteconf.com. I mean, the reason that I picked React Native up in the first place was that I wanted to produce apps and I wanted to get a passive income from them. And I've seen over the last couple of years, there's been a a huge sort of shift in paid for apps versus subscription models. And I've always been of the opinion that I probably want to produce something that's a paid for app. You make one payment, you know where you're getting the apps done, it's yours. But the more I've looked into this and the more I've spoken to other people, I'm finding that actually, if you want to produce a proper income, it's got to be a subscription model. And that kind of matches with your findings? Absolutely, James. Absolutely. I think with paid apps, it's a little bit harder. And we can even get into what, how do you convert those free downloads into subscribers? Because we've, mm-hmm. we've seen some really good results with a couple of different tests on the pricing pages. But yes, subscription-based apps are the way to go. And I know React Native is cross-platform, but iOS is probably better for you guys because if we've seen from the revenue side of things, iOS tends to perform a lot better. Although Android, you get a lot more reach. iOS, you get a lot more money. That is really interesting. I haven't considered that difference before. I mean, that React Native is, is beautiful because it's almost right once deployed in many places. It's so close a lot of the time. So stuff that I've produced, I, I make it in iOS first, but I'm checking it works in Android as well. And they get released together. Um, but it's interesting to know to really put the focus on the Apple side of things. An interesting demographic difference. Yeah, totally. What were the first apps that you wrote then? Just to go back to the beginning of this, because I'm yeah. just interested. What did you make on your sort of side hustle? Oh, James. So back in the day, it was my son. He's now 12. He was mm-hmm. 18 months and we would download apps where it was like ABCs, you know, phonics. And so the first ever app I created was based off this code template that was for a photo gallery. And I was like, oh, I can use this. And I was like, cool. So I made a flashcard app. And I found all the designs myself. So A, I said A, B, C, a go-go. So it was all the alphabets and like different things that can move. So A, airplane, B, bus, C, car, and so forth. And I did all the sound effects too. So I was like, ah, uh, ah, <laughs> uh, airplane, b, 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 bus, right? And I did all of that. But the photo gallery made it easy because I was like, if you tap up top, you get the bubba. And then if you tap on the bottom, you get the bus. And then you just keep swiping and swiping. And so... That was my very first app that I created 
found all the free graphics myself. I think I paid for like for a stock image of all the little art. And then I made the art myself, put it all together and launched it. And back then, James, it was so easy, man. You just launch it. This is 2011. You get thousands of downloads like right off the bat. And I was like, this is so easy. So the next app I created, James, thinking that the thousand download model was great. Yeah. I was like, oh, I'll make the next one paid thousand dollars in the bank right there. Day one, right? Did not happen. So we got like zero downloads that first day because it was paid. It was a 99 cent app and it was a another phonics app, but it was like a, a DJ and then you had this big old board and they can tap different letters and hear the phonics sounds. And so it was all geared towards my son back then. That's really cool. I, it's great to take like, it, it's always those personal experiences that help drive the products, isn't it? And that's what everyone I've spoken to says. And I just, being a one person indie dev, there's a certain romance to that as well, where you get to control every part of your app. You don't have, you haven't got product owners hanging over you. You haven't got the other team not doing the way you want to do it. Yeah. Um, it's a beautiful thing. And I, I'm very excited that you're going to explain to me how I'm going to make my millions today. Yeah, I'm going to do that, James. The proudest moment for <laughs> me was figuring out, because I'm not a coder like you, right? But figuring mm -hmm. out how to do Rain. So I had a different app that I made Rain in, and it was trying to find the different shapes in different scenes. And just to get random raindrops, different sizes, different speed of the fall. Oh my sure. goodness. As a non-coder, that was the proudest thing that I've ever done in my life today. I still speak of like <laughs> getting these raindrops to look like raindrops. So cool. Anyways, we can get into some of the, the ways that you can find profitable app ideas, winning app ideas. Okay, awesome. Um, where do I start? I suppose is the question. So I, I'm working on a couple of things at the moment. Yeah. Um, you want to share what they are? Pitch, yeah, I'll pitch them to you. Um, so <laughs> I play a lot of word games. Like uh -huh. I do a lot of like word-based puzzles. And I was just looking through what is hot in the app store. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, these aren't that great. Or uh, I could certainly make something as good as this. I could put a little twist on it. I can do a couple of little bits on it. So I've made it a game that um, just gives you a word grid and you just pull words out. You've got like a one minute timer. And so my model is this, like you've got a minute and a half, pull as many words as you can. It's got a dictionary that compares the words. And then after the round's finished, you get a bunch of advertisement. And I'm hoping to make some revenue off that. That's the first sort of thing I was thinking of. So how do I take that and translate it into something that maybe is gonna work? Um, or is your advice that I just put that comfortably in the bin and we go and work on something new? Well, no, if I think word games are great, right? I've the vantage that you and I have are we have this platform, we've talked to so many different people. And so there are mm -hmm. certain category of apps and games that have really high retention rate. Word games being one of them, match three games being another. And so I like that model. Like you've studied the, what you want to do is study the app store. So you can go to App Annie. You don't even have to pay for it because they charge you thousands of dollars. Sign up for a free account. You don't even have to connect anything. You can go into the top grossing. So what you want to do is go to games and go to Word games and look at top grossing apps and see what familiar, what type of apps are making tons of money, right? And just study that market a little bit because that way we like this app idea, this flashcard app idea. Sometimes we think we have this great idea and then we get into that. We put it in the app store and people are like, this is crap. And James, like my first app that I made for my son, he literally swiped once and then hit the home button. He was like, done. That was a boring <laughs> game, right? So like, we think we have these ideas, but the goal of this is to really, instead of thinking about what ideas are going to work from you that are coming in your head, really study the market and figure out mm. what app ideas are already working, are already profitable, already generating millions of dollars, and then put your own unique spin on it. And so like Crossy Road, just to play on Frogger, but he was really yeah. inspired. I had him on the podcast by, by Flappy Bird, where you can die almost immediately. And so if you, I've played Frogger and I was like, this is nothing like Crossy Road. Yes, there's some similarities, but it's pretty boring. Like it's flat, it, the designs are fairly flat and you, I don't die right away. And so you think about that, you think about these unique spins that people are putting on. And, and then the best thing, the example that I have for you too is gardenscapes and homescapes. Are you familiar yeah. with these side of and I, I, I have, I've been downloading those, yeah. I haven't, I didn't know it was a match three game at all, James, because when I see the advertisements, I didn't know. Right. I just thought it was like you build your games, but 
we're talking about this with another game developer and you think they took a match three game and added this whole like designing your home and then building your garden, which is, you know, like Farmville and all these things. So they're yeah. starting to combine different elements. And so you got a word game that's high retention and you put your different spin on it. You've got a pretty successful idea, but really studying the market, using app banning, looking at top grossing. And then you mm -hmm. can go to a website called Sensor Tower. You can put in any app you think is successful. And then Sensor Tower will give you a pretty accurate sense of the downloads they're getting and the revenue they're making. Again, this is, these are all free platforms that you can use. You can pay for them, but you can use the free stuff for free. So it's well. uh, appannie.com and then Sensor Tower to double check in a bit more detail about the That's actual right. revenues afterwards. Okay, mm -hmm. awesome. But yeah, that mean, really, if you want to take it one step further, download those games, play it, look at the, the five-star reviews, the four-star reviews, see if there's common themes that people really love mm -hmm. about the app. Obviously, you're going to get, this game's cool, this game's awesome, but you want to get some a sense. And then look at the unfavorable reviews, like the one to two stars, and then you see what you can improve upon. So one thing we did, I'll give you an example, we were doing this for a client of ours, but essentially it was a robo call blocking app. And it looked at one of the big players out there and I looked at his one and two star reviews. He said, they're blocking the important calls. They're blocking everything, right? So what do we do, James? We kind of use that messaging and on our pricing page or in our marketing materials, we say, let the important calls get through. Because we know that's a pain yeah. point for other people. And so that's how you can start leveraging Oh, okay. Well, here's how I do this. How do I improve upon an idea that's already making money and put my own unique spin on it? Sure. I mean, it, it just shows like you need a modicum of business sense. You can't just be a developer anymore. You've got to do a few things to differentiate yourselves. So true. How, how am I going to do this without paying for advertisement or can I not get around that? You don't have to pay for it. I think so I have this series coming up on my podcast where mm -hmm. we're going to talk about, we're going to talk, to, I've talked to a lot of side hustlers and I don't like to call them side hustlers, but like I was in that boat too. And so people who have like a full-time job and then doing apps on the side and what are their strategies to get it out there? And the key is ASO. So you want certain keywords in your app title and your subtitle. A lot of times people use that for branding, the subtitle and stuff, but you really want good keywords in there in the title and the app title. But in the beginning, the common theme has been to spend a couple hundred dollars to get early user feedback. And so one person said, he goes live on Facebook and says, hey, got family and friends, I'm giving away a hundred dollars. I've just launched my new app. Please go check it out, leave a feedback, leave a review in the app store and just let me know. I just want some feedback and I'll put you in a drawing for a hundred dollars. And he's seen pretty good success with that. One thing that he's seen is obviously good feedback, right? You want that mm -hmm. feedback from people. And secondly, you're, it's your friends and family. They're probably going to leave you a good five-star review in the app store, which is going to help you get even more downloads. Yeah. Another person will spend a couple of hundred dollars on Apple search ads. So James, if you go into Apple search ads and you do the basic one, you can tell Apple, here's my app. I only want to pay 50, 60 cents for a download. And that way, Apple will do everything else in terms of finding the right keywords, anything else, and try to hit your goal of trying to get 50 or 60 cents. Because in the early days, what you really want is user feedback. What are people doing in the app? Are they retaining? Are they monetizing? What are they doing, right? I like the, the Facebook live strategy because I almost like people like, it's not, what's the right word I'm wanting to for? Qualitative feedback rather than quantitative, right? I want sure. people to tell me what's wrong with my app rather than just looking at the data and be like, oh, these people are falling out. And so I like that strategy, but the, the, the early on, you got to get that user feedback to make sure you have a really solid product and then you can start improving on it. And I'll give you an example real quick and I'll stop talking, James. But one of my clients, he had a seven page onboarding sequence. You know, he's like, hey, do this, do this, do this. So it was mm -hmm. a robot calling app. And his example was, I was, I blocked text messages. So I would ask them to allow me to block calls so they'd have to set it up in their system. And then I say block text messages. So you have to go to the system, do that. And then I would say, oh, we block ads on Safari too. So go ahead and do that. So he gave it to a friend. I think he was on a date and he said, hey, check out my app. This is my app. And she was going through it and she just stopped. She just stopped and put it away. He's like, what the hell happened? He's like, look, it's too long. I don't want to go through this whole thing. And so he's like, what do I really need? I'm a robot call blocking app. I just need you to block your calls. 
I'll ask you after everything else to block your text messages and your Safari. So he took the seven pages down to four and see, he saw an increase in conversions after doing that. So cool. it's these little things that that's why I like qualitative data instead. You can see it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense actually. I guess I'd like to take you back a little bit to what the keywords that you were saying, because many years ago, part of the business that I ran involved doing search engine optimization. Nice. And it was pretty successful for a little while. And then I think it was the, uh, maybe the penguin algorithm that Google introduced and it, it wiped everything out. And they, Google did the right thing because there were people like me kind of abusing it a little bit. Um, this sounds like it's a little bit similar um, uh, when it comes to putting keywords and stuff in the headings and the subtitles. Could you expand a bit on that and just sort sure. of what, what do I need to do in order to get my app listed in the right kind of places and get it pulled through for people? Yeah, you definitely want. Steve, make us rich. Make us rich. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to certainly try. <laughs> Sorry, I'm like, guys. <laughs> so, James, it's a great question. I think you, what you want is good keywords in your title. So I always like to do a little bit of research before I think about the keywords. And if you've got SEO background, you know research mm. is gonna be valuable, right? And so a tool like Sensor Tower, a tool like Mobile Action, a tool like App Radar, any of these ASO tools where they give you the traffic data and the competition data. That's what I wanna get a sense of. And that way I can start thinking what keywords are gonna be the most valuable for me. And I think the biggest mistake, I just created a YouTube video about this is we, as the beginning, let's say you only have a $200 budget, you go after two competitive keyword. So for example, let's say you have this word game, James, that you're working on and you say word, you know, crossword or word. There was a game I used to play on Yahoo games that sounds very similar to what you're talking about, James, but essentially <laughs> you're going for like, let's say word games in the title. That's way yeah. too competitive, right? And so if you think about like, Who's my target audience? They're word game lovers. What other word games are out there? Now, what I found with one of my clients too was Bananagrams. So I looked at mm. popular word board games on Amazon and I put those into the keyword research and I found that they have decent traffic, obviously, because people know the board game and then lower competition because they don't have an app out there. So those are the type of keywords that you want to start playing around with. Instead of just going for the obvious like word games and trying to put that in your subtitle or title, which is way too competitive. You're never going to rank for it given your budget. Go after these type of things like banana grams or other things like that. Does that make sense? And it absolutely makes okay, sense. Cool. Yeah. Where am I checking for how competitive these keywords are? Is that going to be given to me by Apple or do I need a third party for that? You do need a third party, unfortunately. Sure. Some of these third party tools, if you Google ASO tools, you have Center Tower, Mobile Action, you yep. have App Tweak, App Radar, they'll all give you the competition. Some are more accurate than others, but I think it's a good starting point to get off and at least use data driven metrics, just like you know, James, like you mm -hmm. want the search volume when you do an SEO, you want the competition, you kind of figure out, okay, which keywords like using Ahrefs as a tool. So same type of philosophy when you're doing ASO on the app store. You have a tool that you like better than the others? I, I like from affordability standpoint, app radar has been the best. They are a sponsor of the thing of our podcast too, but I found them to be from a price perspective to be one of the more affordables and their data is pretty accurate. So I'm a paying subscriber as well for app radar. Okay, cool. Um, you were talking a little bit about, it sounded like a pay per click style um, advertising. Could you just go back onto that and just tell me a little bit more about how that gets set up and how that would work? The pay-per-click. So, I mean, the keywords. So, like, let's say Bananagrams you want to put there, right? Yeah. In the, in the ASO, you could put, like, in the keyword field. So, there's a title. You don't want – it's trademarks. So I'm like, we don't want to probably put it in the title and the subtitle no. where it's visible. You want to put it in the keyword field where it is not visible on iOS. Mm -hmm. On Google Play, it's the title, short description, and long description. So, there's nowhere to really hide it. On iOS, you can hide it in there. But let's say you, but you do want your word games in there. And so you do want good keywords in the title and the subtitle. And mm -hmm. so you think about SEO, you have the title, which is the app name. And then you have your H1 tag, which is sort of the subtitle. And then you have your keywords fields, which could, which could be the, the content of your page, or it could be thought of as like the bold or the H2 tags, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's how you start thinking from an SEO perspective. And then you just want those 
in these particular fields. The app title has the most weight, just like SEO and the subtitle has the second most weight. So you want your good keywords in there. Even if they're competitive sometimes, James, I'll still put it in the title because heck, you know, it's the most relevant and you know, it has the most weight. So I want those keywords in there, but that's how you start doing that strategy. When I'm building a new product, G2i is the company that I call to help me find a developer who can build it. G2i is a hiring platform run by engineers that matches you with React, React Native, GraphQL, and mobile developers that you can trust. Whether you are a new company building your first product or an established company that wants additional engineering help, G2i has the talent you need to accomplish your goals. Go to g2i.co to learn more about what G2i has to offer. In my experience, G2i has linked me up with experienced engineers that can fit my budget. And the G2i staff are friendly and easy to work with. They know how product development works and can help you find the perfect engineer for your stack. Go to g2i.co to learn more about G2i. That is such a clear path, actually. Thank you. That, that's really okay. helpful. Cool. Um, I guess we should kind of go over the subscription versus paid for app because yeah. um, that, that is a big deal to a lot of people. And I was saying earlier that in my mind, it was the paid for apps that I'd be sort of looking to make. And when I look for apps, I don't tend to subscribe to a lot personally, but it turns out I'm in the minority or at the very least, the subscription apps are raking in a substantial amount of income for a lot of companies. So I guess what I'd like to know is how do I go about choosing subscription prices? How do I kind of make that appealing to people? Or what kind of advice have you got around pricing strategy? Because that's such a big part of running a business. There's tons of advice on this. So I've been doing, I've been very much focused on the conversion side. The, the thing is to study the market, right? What yeah. are your competitors charging? That'll give you a base point to jump off of. And so certain types of apps, you can charge more, like hundreds of dollars, a year certain other apps maybe they're the the audience is used to paying 20 30 dollars a year so you kind of have to figure out that that market research is so key you're gonna have to figure out what your competitors are charging once you figure that out there are key things to increase help you increase your conversions so mm -hmm. here here it is uh, again you figure it out you might want to be a little bit lower than your competition after you figured out the pricing what you want to do is doing that onboarding flow, James, as you say, hey, you know, you download your app. Welcome to what was your what's the name of your app, James? It's tragically as of yet untitled. Untitled. OK, welcome to James Word <laughs> Game. All right. And then you say, look here, you kind of give them some screens and they, they kind of get a sense and you're like swiping. We see this all the time yeah. at the end, James, pop them up with the, the pricing, right? Mm -hmm. That pricing page. Hey, want to subscribe? Get unlimited, you know, daily content for free, you know, like, or whatever, like daily updated content, whatever that pricing page is, you want to show it during the onboarding process. We've seen double the conversions when you do that. You definitely want that in place. The other thing that we've seen successful is show instant value. Now I can't give away all my secrets, but the key is there's a great book by Dan Ariely that talks about predictably irrational, that we as humans are rational. That if I said, James, I'll give you $5 off this donut, or I'll say, hey, this donut, these 12 pack of donuts, and I'll give you three coffee. The three coffee is like three bucks, right? You're getting the better mm -hmm. value off of the $5 off. You'll pick the three, three coffee, right? So like, where's that instant value? And the things that I would say is, how do you utilize this instant value me mechanism? And the, the thing that I would say, the tip, the other example. So I, once I read that book, I was like, how do I apply this? And for a startup that I used to work for, we tripled our conversions by making a monthly, yearly, right? That's a normal offer. Yeah. Monthly, yearly. And then we would say $25 a month or $199 a year. And you save some. Typical. Mm -hmm. It's what you normally see. Here's what I did. You want, this is A, this is B, monthly. A is the yearly because I want people to on the yearly. Just makes more sense, right? So you definitely want to push sure. people on the yearly. So what I did was I created A minus to show into value. So I said, here's monthly 25, here's yearly 179. Mm -hmm. I knew what our customers wanted. They wanted a video on their website. So I said, here's part of the basic plan that comes with the monthly and it comes with the, the yearly. Then 199, just for $20 more, you get all these features. And so by looking at, by just adding this A minus plan, I was able mm -hmm. to triple the conversions and get way more people on the yearly plan. 
And so that's the, that's what, how you have to start thinking about it. And then the, on the app space, you know, there are the little things that you can do to try to show that instant value for your customer. Okay. So uh, when you say you're going to double the conversion by having it in the onboarding, mm-hmm. is that because people actually sign up for this during the onboarding process? Or is it because they just know in their minds it's there, they're going to come back to it? Both. Both. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, they do sign up for it during the onboarding process because some people yeah. feel like they may need to sign up to use your app, right? We're sophisticated. Mm. We know this, but some people don't. So that's one. And two, yes, you're signaling to them that I'm not a free app that you do have to pay for it. And I think mm-hmm. with app developers, they, we tend to be like, no, I just don't want to be that aggressive. I don't want to be salesy and I don't want to do this. But I put this video together too. I was like, we have a small window of opportunity, James. The average retention rates day one are 28%. You're losing over 20, over 70% of your users on day one. They download your app, they open it, they never come back, right? Yeah, that sounds about right. So you have the oper- you have a very small window to try to get them to one, get what your app does, two, sell them yep. on the app, and then get them to pay. So that's why you want to put it on the onboarding process too. Nice. One that other thing I'm going to throw sense. out here. I've been binge uh, binge consuming everything from Russell Brunson from ClickFunnels. And he's uh, he talks a lot about a lot of these same ideas. I mean, usually the sales funnels are on the internet, right? So it's not in your app. But it's the same idea, right? It's, um, hey, you signed up for a month, but don't you want this other thing? And so you do the one-time upsell. The other thing is, is that I think to your point, Steve, um, as far as people being hesitant to sell, um, my feeling is, is that I just need to make something that's obviously going to pay off for them. And I don't feel bad selling it at all, right? It's like, uh, you're, you're clearly going to get what you want from this. So I'm doing you a favor, <laughs> you know, get the better version, right? And, and you're doing me a favor because the better version cost me some time and effort. So yeah, I just want to put that out there that um, a lot of times I see people and they're like, well, I'm just not a salesman. And I'm like, it's because you don't believe in what you're selling. Yeah, that's um, so true. You know, I, I get out there and I sell podcast sponsorships. And um, when I get focused on the, I need the money, I don't sell as many sponsorships. When I get out there and I focus on the, hey, I'm going to drive you some traffic. And we're going to get some people to convert. That's when I sell. Yeah, so true. So true, Charles. Such a weird mindset that we got to get over because I think there's this like sleazy mentality that, hey, if we're pushy, if we're trying to be salesy, that we feel bad about ourselves or we're like them. And we're not like them, right? We're developers. We know how to make clean code. We make great products, but we're not these marketing sleaze balls. And I think yeah, the customers this, will come to us. Yeah, customers will tell them to us. We yeah. build a great product. They'll just come and we have to get over that mentality that, hey, we need to make money. Because if we make money, we make a better product. And this product is going to help people. And so it was a mindset that I, I'm still struggling with today. So it's not something that just rolls off the tongue for me. But yes, we have to start thinking that way. Yep. That's cool. Is there a, a sort of a product or a, a third-party provider who you use for subscription? So all the platforms have their own subscription stuff. Yeah. James, like you can build it out yourself. Like I've heard of Revenue Cat, and I think Charles, you probably I had them on the say podcast Revenue too. Cat. Yeah. yeah, we spoke to uh, yeah. Jacob, we had Jacob a few weeks ago, yeah. and that was yeah. really interesting. I mean, I was checking it out earlier today, actually knowing that I was coming to speak to you, Steve. And um, the the first ten thousand dollars a month that you make, you don't pay Revenue Cat anything. And I think that that's actually really nice. So until you're actually making a pretty significant amount of money, there's no charge for that. And apparently it's incredibly easy to set up and it's compatible with React Native, which is why we had him on the show. So I, was, I would probably be looking at using that, I think. I just wondered if you had any opinion on that side. Yeah, you don't need anything really. You can just start yeah. charging people right away. It, there is some complexities to, let's say for Apple, because subscription, you're probably going to make most of the money on Apple, but there's certain terminology that you need to understand within Apple. But you, we don't, like a lot of our clients, we, they don't, we don't have anything. We just go into Apple, we will pull all the data and we have this crazy spreadsheet that says, okay, here's what you do. And here's how many people are signing up for the trial here. So many people mm-hmm. are canceling. And so it's this crazy spreadsheet, but you know, a platform like Revenue Cat will probably show you all this stuff. I have no familiarity with it, but it's all within Apple too. So it's just looking at the data. In, uh, in your experience, I guess the, a big question is going to be, and I would certainly be thinking this, and I have been thinking it, you must have a pretty good idea. What is the most profitable app and the most profitable sector 
if I wanted to start from scratch tomorrow and I wanted to tailor something, oh, man. how am I going to make myself rich by next year? Oh man, oh, we had this oh, discussion. We on had IG. this, yes, we did. <laughs> <laughs> so I okay, think- make James rich. <laughs> Josh, I think we talked about this, but I yeah. think at the time I was analyzing this intermittent fasting space and I've been intermittent fasting for a few years now. And I just saw an app that was making, I think it was $300,000 a month. And James, I looked at the category. So I went through it just like mm-hmm. I told you an app, Annie, and I just like did a c- command F on fasting. And I just saw like five or six apps and I just pulled through them and they're all making at least like 80 grand a month. Some were like 500 grand. So like that's a space I don't think enough people are talking about where definitely there's a lot of people like I use an app that tracks my fast. That's all it is. Right. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that I saw five or six doing that, that's a great space. Obviously, meditation is huge. So fitness is huge. But I think if you think about the core thing of like what humans normally use right the so like health and fitness uh help me out guys like productivity those type of things that we're all used to paying already think about that but fasting i was just shocked by the number of apps that i found to be making tons of money like six figures a month and that, that is a source. phenomenal amount are you paying for your fasting app are you subscribe no to <laughs> no interesting um <laughs> what kind of revenue then for, for the stuff that isn't subscription yeah like can I make a living off advertising? That it seems like a big, big ask to do it, but I mean, I'd just be interested to know what you think. So you can obviously, because that's how games really succeed. But I think with non games, it's probably better to go to a subscription route and you can even yeah. see games kind of going towards, Hey, I want to be part of the subscription fund too, but with ads. Yes. So here's what I recommend with subscription based apps. And I have a client where we're going to put up a case study about this. With every subscription-based app, I would have a non-consumable in-app purchase. And I'm talking dev talk now because I'm on a dev show. But a non-consumable in-app purchase allows you to purchase once and get it forever, which is like a remove ads or unlocking a character or, you know, unlock a course within your intermittent fasting app. Right. Yeah, this is what I was going to ask you. Perfect. Cool. So you have a subscription, which is like you get all these, all this content, or you can, if you just want to pay one time for this one course, one little bit of feature, you can pay one time. Here's a trick though. There's a favorite campaign that I know I still run to this day. And I've been doing this for like four or five years, this campaign. You make this non-consumable in-app purchase for free for a couple of days. So this free course that you have, James, you make it free for a couple of days. You say, hey, I'm going to make this free course that's usually $4.99. I'm going to make it free. Then you pitch a site called App Advice. And Tyler, it's a great dude. I know him very well. You tell Tyler, hey, Tyler, I'm making this course. Here's how you get it. You, we're going to be free for a couple of days. Tyler will cover it on his website, and they've got an app as well. And that will drive thousands of downloads. What that does also do, what that campaign also does is increase the conversions of your other in-app purchases, namely your subscription. So we used to run this off of subscription apps just by saying, hey, we're going to do a seven-day trial. Customers got pissed off because they're like, I didn't know I was signing up for a trial. And so you can say, look, you can, you can do it one of two ways. The easiest to do a non-consumable in-app purchase. The more complicated way that requires dev work is to say, you're going to get premium access seven days of my fasting app. You just have to put a little pop-up together, ha- tap this button, and then unlock it. And then you tell Tyler, hey, get, hey, Tyler, I'm giving seven days worth of premium access for free for anybody, or any first-time users. Here's, they're going to get this pop-up. Then that will drive thousands of downloads and hopefully drive more revenue. And so it's a great, easy way, like we talked about, James, in the early conversation about getting feedback. It's one of my favorite campaigns because you don't have to spend any money on marketing. Where else can you get thousands of downloads for your app without really spending any money? And this is the perfect way to do that. Okay, so we're just getting a decent user base to start with, and then they are hopefully going to subscribe later on to other products that we sell, yeah? They will subscribe. What we've seen okay. in the past is if you've got a game, James, you refer back to your word search, word game, if you have mm-hmm. not a lot of the in-app purchases, Let's say you have one that says remove ad. So you make that for free, but then people can buy more coins that give you more access to more content and more words. Well, people actually pay for that stuff. And we've seen this time and time again. And James, the more apps you build, the more, once you run it for one app, 
your whole portfolio rises. So one of our clients did just 25 downloads a day. We doubled it by doing ASO work. We doubled again by do, redoing his icons and all this other stuff. And essentially we ran this campaign. I think we did about 5,000 downloads, but he routinely runs it for all his apps, for every one of his apps. So every week he's doing this for a different app. And now he's grown to 3 million plus downloads and hundreds of thousands daily actives, just starting with 25 and using this campaign and not spending any money on marketing. And now he's emailing me, Steve, like, oh, we're starting to run paid advertising on Google and Apple because of the success of this campaign. So it takes a while. I mean, it took him like 18, to, 18 months, two years to reach this point. But again, if you're committed to this, it's a great campaign. You can continually run it every other month because Tyler doesn't want to cover the same, same apps all the time. Sure. But you can continually run it and you get more and more downloads, more and more subscribers. And so with this one client, what I want to do is run the case study of, do you get more subscribers? In the past, when we did trials, of course we got more subscribers. But now making a non-consumable in-app purchase, purchase for free, can we get more subscriptions as well? And that's the test. I feel pretty confident we will, nice. but I want to see what the lift is going to be. Yeah, that so, sounds great. How do I get hold of Tyler? Tyler at appadvice.com. All right. Okay. Make a note of that. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing I'm wondering is, is the, um, so the one time in app purchase that you're talking about, like you were saying seven days of whatever. So, so to, I guess if I'm offering some kind of premium subscription or some premium ongoing thing, can I offer that for just a limited amount of time and do that as the promotion? Yep. That's it. That would be it, right? Like this is what we just ran yesterday for a client. It was just like a pop-up that says get seven days of premium access for free. And you I just gotcha. hit the little button and then you on the back end, you guys unlock everything. You do your guys' magic in the back end. That makes sense. And then hopefully they like it enough to come back and subscribe. That's it. Yep. That's what you want to do. And we've seen good results, Charles. Like we, one of our clients, the, what we saw. So what he did was you couldn't box out, but I always recommend this. He had the pop up, but you couldn't hit X. You couldn't close out. And so people couldn't subscribe, right? It, it just showed up and it just said, get it for free. Take it. That's it. That's all you can do. We wouldn't let you buy at all. And so what we saw was a trickle down effect. We saw, I think it was 6,000 downloads and then 2,000 downloads day two, and then about 600 downloads, and then 300 downloads, and just maintain for the next. And so when he was asking for that, that pop-up wasn't there anymore, because that pop-up only needs to be there for a couple of days. We saw super high conversion rates during those times, because we're getting that trickle-down effect. We're still getting hundreds and hundreds of downloads, and people were subscribing. So I told him like, dude, next time, let them X out. If they won't want your offer, let them pay for it. Because we saw zero subscribers during the time that he had the pop-up because they couldn't subscribe. So make sure you let them subscribe if they want to as well, right? Give them the access, but make sure you hit them with that popping. The way I like to stack campaigns is a campaign that works really well where you say limited time offer. Charles, you know this, right? Like ClickFunnels, very popular. Dead, they got a deadline, you want a sense of urgency. And so what you say, you want to stack it. And so let's say you have that pop up, you get thousands of downloads that way. After they claim the offer and say, hey, by the way, James, 48 hour sale. Do you want the yearly subscription for like 50% off, for example, right? 48 hour sale, special pricing. And we know that converts really well when you have another pop up that says it's a limited time offer and you're giving a discount on the yearly. Yep. You build in scarcity. That's it. Scarcity and urgency. I'd like to know how I get featured by Apple because I know that you've done some work getting people featured. Super simple, James. So I, I yeah. gave this, not simple, it's hard. But the cool thing about Apple, it's very editorial. And I've shared this in the past. So here's what you do. You want to find somebody on LinkedIn and just search for App Store and you filter by company and you put Apple. Now you want to go to the person that's in your home developer country. So if you're in the US, you go to US. If you're in the UK, you go to the UK. If you're in Australia, you go to Australia and find App Store Manager, okay? You, what I like to do, James, is make sure I know a little bit about the person. So I said, James, look, I'm sure you can strum really well on your guitars because I can see it in the background, but I want to build that, right? So you looked them up on LinkedIn. You got to do some research, 15 minutes tops. Maybe mm -hmm. search for them on Instagram, search for them on Facebook. Know a little bit about somebody and then easy to find somebody's email, do rocketreach.co, any of these platforms where they find their email addresses and you cold email them. 
And here's one client that got featured. We did everything for them. He essentially found out that they grew up in a very close area, right? They were like, so his email subject line was from one Midwesterner to another. And then he said, hey, blah, blah, blah. I grew up in a neighboring town, da, 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 da. And then here's my app. Would you like to feature it? And we got that featured. And one of, I made a pitch to somebody else and I met, I saw that he met Tony Hawk because I was scrolling through his Instagram, pretending like I followed him for years, right? Because I didn't want to just look at the top and be like, oh, okay, let me just make a reference to that. I just kept scrolling scrolling until I found something cool. And I was like, whoa, that's Tony Hawk. That's pretty cool. And then my subject line to him was, you met Tony Hawk? And I was like, hey, Jordan, blah, 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 blah. And then I make that pitch, right? So keep it short, but always build that rapport. And I think the more you make it about that person and the more you know about that person, it's always a little bit better. And one trick that somebody sent me as in cold email that I really enjoyed. So the PS is a very powerful line in your email, mm -hmm. right? A PS. And so their PS was my aunt went to UC Davis, which is the college I went to. And I was like, that's pretty clever because I don't know who your aunt is, right? I have no way of verifying this. You didn't say that you went to UC Davis, which I can verify <laughs> by going to your LinkedIn. And so you said your aunt went there. So it's one saying that you did research on me, that you knew I went to UC Davis. And two, I have no way to verify this. So I'm like, okay, that's brilliant. We're going to copy that strategy. And so it's sort of doing that, that type of stuff, like building up the rapport and then cold emailing them and saying like, we want to be featured. And we typically do for our clients too, James, is actually put a presentation together, like an investor pitch that is Apple specific. So you, you point out some of those highlights in your email, but then you put a presentation together just through Google side to make it look pretty. And then you say, Hey, Apple, here's some features and we want to try to get it featured. So that presentation is pretty key. Just makes you look a little bit different as well. Back when functional programming was making its resurgence, I found it really interesting that a lot of people were moving over there and it almost felt like it was on hype. And I didn't really understand the power of functional programming until I learned Elixir. Elixir is a functional programming language. It's built on the Erlang virtual machine. And it really does some interesting things and makes you build apps in a different way. But what's really fascinating about it is the speed of the applications, the ability to distribute work easily, and just how it manages the functional programming and all of the nice things about it so that you don't have to worry about side effects and a lot of the other things that come out of functional programming. Plus, pattern matching in Elixir is a killer feature. If you're looking for a new language that you want to learn that is going to make a difference for you and give you the opportunity to challenge some of your thinking and find a new way of doing it, Elixir is a great way to go. And we have a podcast now on Elixir called Elixir Mix. And you can find that at elixirmix.com. I would not have expected that. In my mind, it was like the, the a team of Apple people are scrolling through apps and they're looking at them and they're picking them or it goes by notable downloads or something. But I hadn't realized you could actually influence people and get that placement. Yeah, I mean, they are doing that, James. But yes, they're very right. editorial. And so you can always pitch them and be like, hey, you know, I'd love to hopefully try to get featured. And I always just ask for advice. So I don't just say, James, feature me. I say, hey, James, you know, we'd love to be get featured. Would you mind checking out my, my app and give me some feedback? And that's my goal workaround. That is trying a to get nice way to phrase it. Like, this is the interesting thing, isn't it? Because there are a lot of people who are very good at developing and there are a lot of people making good apps. But to get anywhere with that app, you can't just stick it on the store anymore. You've got to do all this extra legwork in order to you know, put the work in. You've got to do the marketing, the advertising. You've got to do some sales strategy. And it's kind of, it's work that's outside the comfort zone, I think, of a lot of devs. Um, and it's really interesting to hear somebody quite clearly explain how you get from A to B. I, I presume that if I can't do that myself, I can come to you and you can do it for me, right? That's right. Yeah, we can do that's that. Cool. That's App Masters, isn't it? That's your company. That's right. Yes, and sir. tell me about your best client that you have. Without wanting Damn. to pick favorites, it's a tough wow. one, isn't it? There's so many, but like one of, the, one of my clients that I really like right now is the robot call blocking app, right? And it's called robot uh -huh. call blocker. You can search for it in the app stores. The reason why I picked him out out of all the clients, because I love them all. I but, need that. <laughs> right, Charles? So like, <laughs> I- I get I, it right now. I had RoboKiller, which is a big competitor of his, but then he's mm -hmm. way cheaper. I mean, not, a little bit cheaper, right? And so he's 33% cheaper, great app, does everything I needed to do. And one reason that I like about him, I just had him on the podcast. Look, it took him, He's like, I've been banking apps for the te past 10 years. I found success in the last two. And he was doing 
the same thing that we talked about earlier, researching the market, figuring yep. out that robot calling blocking apps were really successful, making tons of money and built in similar app that way. And then we also A-B test a lot of stuff, right? The, the pricing page where I told you guys about instant value, we A-B tested that. We saw a 70% increase in download or conversions, subscribers, and about a 46% increase in revenue per download. And then he A-B tested the onboarding process. And so the reason why I pick him out is I just love the hustle. I love that the fact that it takes us so long to find success. It's not an overnight success story. And it's somebody who followed this model of search, researching the market and building an app and then finding success and constantly A-B testing and also reinvesting in some of that. So he was the one that said, hey, I've spent $200 on Apple search ads. Now he's spending a lot more, but he's in the early days, he was just spending that much just to see how many people were converting. And if they were converting, heck, now he can invest some more time into this particular app. So robot call blocker. Yeah, that's cool. And what you say about success is so right. Like it doesn't come. I, the annoying thing is I'm, it looks like it does for some people, right? There's always these stories about that person that made it overnight, but you don't hear about the five or six years they spent not making it overnight. Like it, you will make it overnight, but not without years of work ahead of before it. So true. I mean, you think about yeah. Angry Birds, they'd say 51, that's said. Right. Color Switch, David Reichold, I've had him on the podcast, a good friend of mine now. He's like, that was my 40th app. And then Crossy Road with Matthew Hall. You think like, you know, these are independent developers who made it without a huge company name. He's like, I've been making games since I was 12 years old. And I think he's in his 40s now. But like, you know, like it just doesn't happen quickly. And I think people... The one thing about app space is you see a lot of people, you hear a lot of success stories and you see a lot of people coming in, which I love, but at the same time, like you think it's so rep replicable and you don't understand the intricacies of an app, just submitting an app and waiting for Apple to review an app and putting all these little things. Mm -hmm. People are so overwhelmed afterwards. Like, oh my God, I just thought I hit a button and hit sub submit and it goes on the app store. Yeah. It's like, no, you have to do all these little things just to get it out. Forget the marketing piece, right? Just for Apple to approve your app, you have to do so many things and then finally do some marketing too. Yeah. It's quite an eye opener for some people, I imagine. I uh, so the first time I did it, like I knew what was coming up because I I read a lot about the process before I got into it. But like it, it is it's a process. It's a business process. You're not just a developer. If you're going to be an indie app producer, there's a lot of other things you've got to be able to do as well. I think that's pretty much bringing us up on time. Um, yep. Charles, you got anything to add? The only thing I'm going to add is that we did have Steve on iFreak show a little bit ago, and he basically talked through the whole process of finding and identifying the app that is going to bring in the revenue and to get an idea of how much revenue you can make and things like that. So if you're looking for sort of that kind of a run through, um, definitely go check that out. Yeah. We went in way more detail. Yeah, we did. Episode. Yeah. It was fun. So, yeah, but that's, I mean, that's pretty much it. So anyway. Okay, cool. Uh, you say you spoke to the Rovio guy, Steve, just as a yep. last thing. Mm -hmm. I, I heard that Angry Birds was like a, a last ditch kind of attempt for them. Were they like right on the edge by mm -hmm. the time they released that? And it just went crazy. Yeah. Oh, he wasn't one of the founders, but he was an executive. He was one of the, like, you know, the senior level guys that had him on. He said, yeah, true story. It was his 51st, 50 something app. And it was really the last ditch effort for them too. Wow. And then boom, it took off, right? And now they have merchandise. But sometimes it's just, we don't hear enough of that. And I wish we told more of that. Like it was, it's a struggle for anybody in the early days. Yeah. So it's okay. Cool. I've got to get my own Angry Birds app going on, haven't I? It's, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's got to be doable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I guess it's time to do some picks then for this week. Um, yeah. Let Charles, me throw one more along? thing out real quick. So I've been talking okay. to Steve. I'm going to be reaching out to Jacob from Revenue Cat. We talked uh, about him a minute. Um, and then I'm going to be talking to a few other folks um, from either iFreaks or this show. And I, I don't have details yet, but what I'm really wanting to do is basically allow developers to go through like a two or three month challenge where they um, go through the process that Steve outlined in iFreaks where it's, okay, you know, go look at the app store, go look at what they're making, you know, figure out, okay, this looks like a lucrative app. Um, you know, maybe people can even team up if they need a back end. I also have friends that work for like Amazon. And so I might work something out with like Amazon Amplify for a back end. Um, but yeah, just do a challenge where after two or three months, you know, you have an app in the app store that actually takes subscriptions and, and uh, one-time purchases and see if we can 
um, flex our business muscles a little bit as developers and flex our developer muscles a little bit and see if we can create a second track of revenue. So anyway, I'm still working through that. Um, and I have a JavaScript challenge. In fact, I should mention that since we're doing picks. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'm looking at this fall. So keep an eye out for that. But uh, it'll be relevant to iFreaks, um, to this show, and probably to like freelancer show. Um, and then, yeah, my other pick is, this is a JavaScript-based podcast. Um, I don't know if you all have read the um, You Don't Know JS Yet books by Kyle Simpson, but Kyle and I teamed up and we're doing a 30-day challenge based on his first book. And uh, basically his books just walk you through the internals and fundamentals of JavaScript, right? So it's like, you know, why when I do this, does it always do that? And it turns out that there is actually a reason designed into the language for that. And so if you're running into those issues or you feel like you're being held back because, gee, I understand React, but I don't understand what JavaScript's doing here. Um, that's what this challenge is for. Um, it's $197. I've been telling people to use the code JSJabber, which is our JavaScript podcast. Uh, that'll get you $50 off. Um, it starts July 20th. So yeah, by the time this goes live, I guess you might've missed it because I don't know the exact schedule on that, but um, keep an eye out because I'm looking to do other challenges. Uh, also React Native Remote Conference in September. It was going to be in July, but I'm moving it. Um, and uh, yeah, so anyway, keep an eye out on all of that stuff and keep an eye out for that challenge. I'll probably actually just throw in like a five minute announcement quasi episode on this feed when we do it, but um, yeah, I'm hoping to get that nailed down and planned out here within the next few months. And then, yeah, we'll, we'll make sure that you get what you need so that you can show up in the app store. You get found in the app store. Uh, Jacob can help you get all your subscriptions and, and one-time purchases and all that stuff figured out. Um, we'll have some technical experts if you don't know how to do something in React Native or Swift. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll set up kind of a curriculum to follow and make that all work. Cool. That sounds good. Really taking Steve's advice about cross promotion to heart as well. Straight in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm excited about that challenge, Charles. It's going to be fun. Yeah. I'm actually, be. I'm actually turning one of my apps that's in app purchase only to a subscription. So we can use that as a case study for redesigning yeah. it and redoing everything with the app. Sounds good. That sounds cool, Steve. What, uh, what picks have you brought along this week? So there's a couple that I have since a developer related podcast. There mm -hmm. is a book that I love that I've referenced called Influence by Robert C Cialdini. But anyways, I'll put that into the chat. So you guys have that as well, but it talks all Great about book. marketing. I love that book. So it's the, it's called Influence, the Psychology of Persuasion. And then I love audiobooks. There's, if you want free audiobooks, there's an app called Libby that connects directly to your local library. You just put your library card in there and you can get all the audiobooks, really all the in, like Kindle books too. But I love consuming audiobooks that way. I do have Scribd that I pay for, James. Back to, I do mm -hmm. pay for some stuff. And <laughs> Scribd is like a Netflix for all audiobooks and books and magazines and stuff. But they've got a good collection. They don't always have the latest titles like an Audible would, but it's only $8.99 and you get a ton of content, audiobooks and books, and magazines and stuff. So those would be my picks. Hey, they sound really good. I'll, I'll definitely check that book out. Yeah. Uh, this week I am bringing along a very old game. I, well, one of my earliest computer game memories are of playing Eye of the Beholder 2. And it's available on, uh, it's an old dungeon crawler. It's like, it's a, it, it's a pretty mediocre, it's a, no, nah, it, it's actually quite good. It's an old dungeon crawler game, DOS days. I had it on my 286. This is a long time ago. <laughs> and um, I discovered it on uh, Good Old Games uh, a couple of years ago. And I finally finished it last week. It's taken me 25 plus years to get through this game and uh i'm just delighted that it's done and uh it, it's really cool because i could almost make some of that game now um it's one of those sort of pretty basic sort of games it's quite clear how all the mechanisms work it's quite clear how you would program it and uh the guy who was the lead programmer is uh phil goro who he worked for ea worked for westwood studios I think he does something with a, a golf company now. I try to add him on LinkedIn. He hasn't accepted me. It's a real shame. I just desperate to tell him how much I love that. But uh, yeah, that's my pick for this week. If you want an old throwback DOS dungeon crawler, Eye of the Behold is where it's at. Love it. 25 years. Yeah. You feel great, huh? Feel Did good. Did you do anything to celebrate? 
uh i <laughs> no not really i just picked up i've got a lot of games i need to finish at least like i just feel good for ticking them off getting through it that's awesome <laughs> i i remember a couple of those yeah dungeon crawler games and especially the text-based ones where it's like uh pick up axe right <laughs> you yeah. just type it in the, the text-based ones were yeah a few years prior to that. this one is at yeah. least all graphical at the <laughs> which is good yeah <laughs> Uh, right, good deal. Steve, if people want to get hold of you, man, how can they, how can they do that? Yeah, just go to appmasters.com. If you want to mm -hmm. listen to the podcast, it is, if you search for Steve P. Young, you'll find it better than searching for app marketing or app masters because sure. apparently, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't rank very well for that. I don't know anything about podcast <laughs> SEO. And then check out our YouTube channel. It's just appmasters.com slash YouTube if you want to see some of the videos. We try to publish every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. We do, we go live every Friday, 9 a.m. Pacific time just to help answer questions. We all actually audit apps too. So if you want us to take a look at your app and give you some feedback on it, you know, just submit that form. But yeah, join us every Friday at 9 a.m. Pacific time on YouTube. Fantastic. I absolutely will do that. Uh, Charles, can people get hold of you on Twitter? Who, me? Yeah. Yeah. CMAXW. C-M-A-X-W. Awesome. Uh, you can get hold of me at Stern Job Name on Twitter, or if you want to tweet us, we are React Native underscore r, &R on Twitter as well. Uh, it'd be great to hear from you. And until next week, thanks very much. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.